Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a talk on running a successful code blue. This is very important stuff if you're working in an ER or really anywhere in the hospital uh, because you can run into a patient who we say is quote unquote coding. Now, if you are a resident or perhaps even a medical student who's done ER rotation, it's very possible that you went through an ACLS course uh, in addition to your BLS uh, basic life support. Uh, course that pretty much everybody who works in a healthcare setting is required to go through. Uh, ACLS, the ACLS course would cover what I'm about to talk about. Uh, so if you've gone through that, then you probably know all this stuff. This is just the pertinent stuff for the USMLE. So it's not going to cover uh, information that goes beyond that. Certainly there are other rhythms that you will want to be aware of, and I talk about those elsewhere in the cardiology section. Um, but uh, but this is, uh, as far as uh, coding patients, this is the most important uh, stuff, really the only stuff that will come up as far as, uh, as, far as Code Blues go. Um, so this is an update. Uh, this is currently the 2018 AHA guidelines. Uh, the lecture I gave previously was from 2013, and there were uh, some significant updates in the last couple years. So even though I'm putting this video up uh, because there was a problem with the sound in the last video, this is actually a bona fide update. So I am providing new information here, uh, or maybe rather revised information uh, with this lecture. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can get to that by clicking the link in the upper right hand corner. It should be an I button or uh, in the description of the video where I have a link as well. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium content in which I go over case studies, differential diagnosis, treatment plan, things that will be handy for you uh, for your future. So thank you very much in advance for your consideration. So what is a code blue? Well, code blue is really an informal term that's thrown around in the hospitals. Uh, you may hear the term blue alert or code blue, uh, but anytime you hear the, the color blue thrown around in the hospital, you're typically talking about a patient who's had a sudden loss of pulse, pulselessness, uh, which coincides with a drop in blood pressure and consequently a loss of perfusion. And that's what we're really concerned about, loss of perfusion to the brain, loss of perfusion to the heart muscle itself, loss of perfusion to other vital organs. And so because of this, death will result in around five minutes without proper resuscitation, and brain damage can occur uh, even earlier than that. And this is commonly a reason why people will go into the so-called vegetative state, um, because they suffer brain damage from, uh, from, from loss of perfusion. Obviously, this is a medical emergency. I shouldn't even need to tell you that. Your first step, of course, your ABCs, and we're worried about perfusion and blood flow. Um, so uh, the, the first step is to try to do everything we can to get that blood pumping. And so we do that by initiating CPR. Uh, so CPR, you learn in your BLS course, uh, we, we do the 30 and 2, however, uh, more recently they've gone to just 30 and forgone, forgone the, uh, the breaths, uh, but uh, you'll see in the hospital that the 30 and 2 is still very consistently used uh, despite the changes to the BLS training. So uh, you do the 30 strong chest pumps, you roughly want to go about 100 beats per minute. So if you've ever heard the song Staying Alive, which you can, I, I can't put that song on here for copyright reasons, but you go on YouTube, uh, you can hear what that song sounds like. It has a, a, a rhythm of about 100 beats per minute. So think of that song, that's about 100 beats per minute. So you'll do 30 strong chest pumps, two breaths, making sure that you look for symmetrical chest rise. Uh, ensure full chest recoil during pumps. So when you're pressing down, you want to make sure that the chest comes all the way back up before you push down again. And make sure that these are nice, strong chest pumps, too. I've seen some uh, medical students who uh, give really weak pumps. Remember what you're trying to do. You're trying to get the heart to pump blood out. Uh, you're not just 
pressing on the chest. You need to push down vigorously. And that can be easier said than done because you may have a patient who's, you know, a little old lady and you think, well, I might crack her ribs. And the fact is you may uh, crack a patient's ribs while you're doing this, but uh, you, you have to think of the risk versus benefit. Uh, the risk of not pumping hard uh, would be that the patient dies from lack of perfusion. Um, the risk of pumping hard is that you may crack some ribs, but the patient survives. So, uh, you know, I think the, the answer to that is pretty clear. So just ensure full chest re recoil and give very strong pumps. Somebody qualified should meanwhile be attempting to place a, an ET airway. And, uh, you know, most physicians are going to be trained on this, but the ones who are best at this are the anesthesiologists. So if you have an anesthesiologist present, great. Problem is if you're in the ER or if you're on the wards and a patient goes code blue, you probably don't have an anesthesiologist on hand. So whoever is best at placing the airway uh, should be the one that's doing it. However, all physicians should be trained in airway placement. Uh, I had an anesthesiology rotation when I was a medical student and and uh, got really good at placing airways. Problem is, I have a lazy eye, so my depth perception is not the best. It took me quite a while uh, to figure out how to place, and I had to go more by feel than by, by vision. Uh, so this is something that you'll want to get good at uh, as you go into your practice. In a pulseless patient, as I said, CPR is always the first step. You know, you learn your... Uh, your, your technique, but uh, you want to make sure that you interlock your hands. This is a good way of getting uh, a, good, a good strong pump. And you do this right in the middle, right over the sternum, in between the nipples. Uh, it should be pretty obvious to you uh, that that's where the heart is. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're compressing there. Uh, like I said, it's possible to have, uh, to have fractures, but the, uh, the risks are, are certainly uh, outweighed by the benefits of, uh, of pumping hard enough. So when CPR is being administered, you want somebody to be reading the EKG. Getting an EKG is very important. It's going to dictate your next steps. So when you're reading the EKG, you need to know what these different rhythms are. And I go into these in all of the other lectures in cardiology. Um, there goes my German Shepherd. Sorry about that. Uh, the, uh, the first thing that you need to do is determine whether or not the rhythm is shockable. So there are two shockable rhythms. Everything else is going to be non-shockable. So uh, pulselessness, as a general principle, can occur with any rhythm. Uh, the shockable rhythms are ventricular fibrillation, otherwise known as V-fib, and ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC. Now, not all VTAC is going to be a code blue. There are patients who have VTAC with a pulse. That's very common. Um, that's not going to be a code blue. You're not going to be doing CPR because their heart is beating. Now, you are going to intervene, but here we're only talking about pulseless VTAC as far as being a rhythm uh, that uh, you'll shock as part of a code blue. Um, can we uh, cardiovert pulse, uh, VTAC with a pulse? Yes, but that's, that's not a code blue because VTAC with a pulse has a pulse. So here we're only talking about ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VTAC. These are shockable rhythms. Non-shockable rhythms is everything else. So pulseless electrical activity, that's basically anything uh, where you have uh, an electrical rhythm, but you don't have a pulse. Uh, so anything but VFib or VTAC. And then asystole, and we'll take a look at what that looks like in a little bit. Pulseless electrical activity, as I said, is any rhythm besides VFib, VTAC, and asystole that's occurring without a pulse. So you can see four, uh, five rhythms actually here. So um, up above here, this is VTAC, a ventricular tachycardia. In particular, this is a monomorphic VTAC. All of the uh, so-called QRS complexes are, uh, they look identical. So this is VTAC. This here is VFib. Uh, you can see that you don't have uh, any discernible uh, ventricular uh, contractions here, ventricular electrical activity. This is ventricular fibrillation. Uh, this is also ventricular fibrillation down here. Uh, this here is asystole. You can see there's no electrical activity in the heart whatsoever. 
This down here looks like a sinus rhythm, but if the patient is pulseless, we would call this pulseless electrical activity. And pulseless electrical activity can look like a lot of different things. Um, the fact of the matter is it doesn't fall into any of these categories, um, but you do have electrical activity. So that would be pulseless electrical activity. And as I say here, this is one possible manifestation of PEA. You do want to make sure, though, that the patient is actually pulseless. And you'll know because the patient will typically lose consciousness, their blood pressure will drop, they'll go into shock, etc. So these are shockable rhythms here, VTAC and, uh, pulseless VTAC and VFib. And then these here in the green are the non-shockable rhythms. So if you have V-fib or pulseless V-tac, you know that you have a shockable rhythm. If the patient is still conscious, then you can sedate them if it's possible uh, because it's not very comfortable, as you can imagine, to be uh, shocked uh, when you uh, are conscious. Uh, so your very first step is always going to be your ABCs. Once you do that, you read your EKG, you know you've got a shockable rhythm, then your very first step is cardioversion. Uh, now, the exact setting to which you set your, your defibrillator is not important for the USMLE, but I did put it here uh, for your information. And that really depends on uh, if, if you have VTAC, whether it's monomorphic or polymorphic. Uh, so with monomorphic VTAC, you'll start off with 100 joules on the first attempt, and then you'll increase it progressively uh, with each attempt. With a polymorphic uh, VTAC, you, uh, it, it depends on your device. If it's monophasic, you're going to go with 360 joules. If it's biphasic or you don't know, you go with 200 joules. Now these apply for, uh, for VTAC. If you have VFib, then you just treat it as a polymorphic. Uh, VTAC. So if it's monophasic, you go 360, or sorry, if it's uh, for v, uh, v, uh, fib, if it's monophasic, you go with 360. If it's biphasic, you go with 200. This is not going to be tested on the USMLE. What you need to know for the USMLE is that VFib and pulseless VTAC are uh, shockable rhythms, and so defibrillation is something that we would do in the case of these particular rhythms. Make sure that before you uh, go ahead with the defibrillation that you warn all the other resuscitators before delivering a shock because this is an electrical current. If anybody else is touching the patient or touching something that's touching the patient, they're liable to get uh, shocked and then you may have two code blues on hand. So you don't want to do that. Make sure that you warn everybody. And that's done simply as you've probably seen in the movies when they say clear and then boom, shock. Uh, once you do that, you want to assess for pulse rhythm and then resume CPR. So it, it could happen that with the defibrillation, you may obtain a rhythm, and then you want to make sure that there's a pulse with that rhythm. Or it may happen that you've gone from a non or a, a shockable rhythm to a non-shockable rhythm, in which case we would uh, we would change our approach. So you want to make sure that you're uh, reassessing the patient. If the patient uh, continues to not have a pulse, then you need to resume CPR, as we talked about, um, immediately. So after the first shock, if there's still no pulse, uh, during the CPR, you're going to administer IV epinephrine, and that's one milligram, and you can administer that every three to five minutes. And that happens to uh, be roughly uh, a, a cycle here as we talk about each round. Uh, the next thing to do is then to shock the patient again, and then you again check for pulse rhythm and resume CPR. I'm really sorry about my dog up there. I hope that's not too loud. Um, so it used to be that we would give uh, 40 units of vasopressin as another option for VFib and pulseless VTAC, as well as for asystole and uh, pulseless electrical activity. That is no longer uh, recommended by the American Heart Association. So we do not, we do, not do that anymore. And then as for the third round, uh, if there continues to not be a pulse, uh, then you can consider the administration of amiodarone, 300 milligrams, or magnesium, uh, 2 grams. Amiodarone itself uh, can be repeated once in subsequent rounds, but you would give 150 milligrams, so half the dosage. Uh, magnesium cannot be repeated. And amiodarone is preferable to lidocaine. Uh, in, in previous algorithms, amiodarone and lidocaine were considered uh, 
you know, equivalent, uh, but now we uh, do believe that amiodarone is preferable to lidocaine. And as a matter of fact, the last time I went through my ACLS course, which was last year, uh, lidocaine wasn't even mentioned. So uh, I'm not sure if that's been dropped entirely, but I do know that vasopressin has been dropped. Um, so you can, again, continue to shock them so long as they uh, have a shockable rhythm and you just repeat this process. And I will just say at this point, um, if you continue this and you're not successful, eventually you may just consider calling it quits. Um, but this requires the discretion of an attending physician. So not even a resident can make that decision. If you have asystole or pulseless electrical activity, these are non-shockable rhythms, so we don't even worry about a defibrillator here. Uh, during CPR, you can administer IV epinephrine, one milligram, uh, and IV atropine, but the atropine is only going to be administered if you have asystole, so this here, or pulseless electrical activity that appears bradycardic, so less than 60 beats per minute. You can repeat epinephrine every three to five minutes. Atropine can be given up to three milligrams. So you can repeat that uh, two times after the first dosage. Every three to five minutes, you wanna check the pulse and rhythm. And so this continues also like a cycle. You wanna make sure that you're monitoring your EKG uh, to see if your rhythm has changed. You wanna make sure that you're checking uh, for a pulse um, and you'll have somebody um, monitoring that the entire time. Uh, which gets us into uh, our uh, some notes here. Uh, shockable rhythm can convert to a non-shockable rhythm or vice versa, so do keep watch of the EKG. You need to make sure that you have a team. This is a team effort, so roles should be delegated. Whoever is the most senior person around is the person who should be the leader. Um, this is a physician uh, that will order medications, administer defibrillation as necessary, and most importantly, delegate roles. So you over there do this. You over there do that. You need to be uh, need to not be shy about this. Uh, so this really needs to be a, a leader. Um, the uh, intubator should be a physician with experience to place a, a, a ET tube. Uh, very, very, very important uh, aspect of this because uh, this is what keeps us from having to do mouth to mouth. Um, so these patients do need to be uh, oxygenized because uh, these codes can go on last minutes and minutes and they do need oxygen. Um, so like I said, ideally this is an anesthesiologist, but since they're not always available, somebody with real good experience doing this. Uh, the thinker should be uh, someone who can identify the possible underlying cause. So this is also somebody that should be reading the EKG um, and checking that to make sure uh, that you're not converting to a non-shockable rhythm, in which case uh, defibrillation would be futile, uh, to see if that you're going if you're going into a sinus rhythm, which would be a, a really good thing. Um, and then also, uh, you know, this could be someone that's keeping uh, a watch on the pulse as well. The IV nurse uh, can be a nurse or any trained professional to administer IV medications. Starting the IV, very important. Usually it's nurses who are trained at starting, you know, we're all supposed to be trained on running an IV, but be honest with yourself. If you're a physician, when was the last time you actually started an IV on a patient? I think the last time I started an IV in a patient was like two years ago. So would I feel comfortable doing an IV on a patient who is in, uh, in danger of losing their life? Hell no. So, uh, you know, this is typically going to be a nurse because they are, you know, the pros at that. But anyone who can uh, start an IV uh, who's experienced with that should be the one that, that does that. And they can also administer the medications at, at the demand of the leader. And then CPR givers can be really anyone uh, because most people are trained in CPR who work in a healthcare setting. So this is often medical students. Um, this is a good way of getting them in to uh, get some experience with codes. Um, 
So anyone trained in CPR, if you're the CPR giver, you need to be very conscious of your energy level. So make sure and ask someone else if you're tired, preferably at least two people uh, should be there. So one for pumping, the other for masking until you can get the, the ET tube placed. Uh, so, uh, but make sure that, that you are, are uh, humble and, and ask someone else to step in if you're tired. It's, it's really important because if you're not pumping strongly enough, you're not going to be perfusing properly and the patient is going to be uh, much worse off. So what causes cardiac arrest? This just kind of draws in some of our cardiology we've been talking about in our other talks. Uh, so six H's and five T's, hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion or acidosis, hypo or hyperkalemia, and hypothermia. Our T's are toxins, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, thrombosis, or trauma. And it can be idiopathic, uh, but the basic appearance a metabolic profile and history should clue you in. And you'll see me putting in interchangeably BMP, CMP. You can use your judgment as to whether or which one you want to get. Probably BMP would be uh, would suffice if you have a patient with an acute cardiac condition. Post resuscitation, uh, after a successful resuscitation, the patient should be immediately transferred to an ICU. House telemetry and proper ventilation are mandatory, so these people need to be on continuous monitoring. Uh, full physical examination is absolutely critical. Check ribs to make sure that there's uh, no trauma from CPR, but we are going to get imaging for that purpose. Labs include serial CMPs or BMPs, a CVC, cardiac enzymes, chest x-ray to, uh, among other things, check the ribs for any breaks, and then other diagnostic tests as necessary based on the patient's state. And intense monitoring should be uh, taken over the next 24 to 48 hours, as I said, in an ICU setting. Most importantly, running a successful code blue is about teamwork and communication, so this really tests those skills. So uh, if you have any questions, write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you next time.